What's up, y'all? This is Jesse Warden, and this evening we're going to talk about the gaming workflow or the game development workflow. So I'm Jesse Warden. I'm a consultant by day. I work at uh, Web App Solution. We typically do staff augmentation, consulting for Java, Flex, HTML5, whatever. By night, I'm a game developer, at least trying to be, learning, participating in the one game a month, and having a lot of fun, and I encourage you to do so as well. I've learned a lot already in just the first month. Um, we're also going to really focus on what the tooling is this evening and the iteration process between those tools. So I had a subscriber, the background of this presentation, I had a subscriber on YouTube who asked, you know, I know some of the tools, but what is the workflow? How do these tools work together? So I thought it'd be neat to show some of the highlights of reasons as to why I use certain tools. What are the workflows between those tools? And how do you go back and forth? And how do you integrate it with the game engine? And what do you really use them for, that, you know, collectively? It's not just, you know, using one tool and programming all day or doing art all day or whatever it is, okay? So I think the caveat here is that I'm using um, all of these tools for Corona, right? SDK, which is very similar to Moi or Look2D. It's all about two-dimensional games. So if you're wondering what those are, it's anything from Angry Birds that has like physics or World of, World of Goo, which has joint kind of physics. We actually build joints together and they have gravity. Um, anything that's an overhead shooter, like an airplane, you know, some of the best Japanese overhead shooters are, are done in 3D nowadays, but some of the old old good ones are all overhead shooters. 1942 is really the good example of one. Um, and side-scrolling games, anything that has, you know, characters that jump and go from left to right or whatever it is. So those are the kind of games that I'm talking about building, okay? So why is workflow important? Well, workflow is important because it's a set amount of tools that specialize in something cool. And you use those tools to build or create or edit something that is cool and put it in your game. And if something's wrong or broken, you can edit it. You can bring it through each one of those tools and bring it back and make sure that it looks good or sounds good or works good with other things together. So that is what we're going to talk about and keep in mind is it's not just the tool. It's that you, you got to understand that I'm just one dude, okay? <laughs> I'm a hobbyist. And I'm building uh, small games on a one-man team. I'm not really doing large games. I'm not doing AAA games. Uh, I'm currently not working with a multi, you know, geographically distributed team. I'm just doing it for myself. Um, I might, I'm trying to find some people to partner with later this year on other games. So just keep in mind that as a hobbyist and as a non-artist, a lot of these tools I might be using in an inefficient manner, but they work for me. So I'm going to show you the things that I do. And if you don't like it, that's great. You should always improve. It's, it's there's a lot of wonderful things about specializing, okay? Additionally, this is just my way of doing it. Some people prefer to do anything, uh, other ways of working. And I know a few of those, so I'll try to bring those up. So when you see that, and go, I don't like that. And it's like, well, be aware that others do it this way, okay? So those are the caveats, okay? All the tools that work through doing a simple 2D game. And these are mine, okay? I use my notebook. I use things like Evernote and Trello to keep track of all my ideas and things like that. We're talking about Flash, using the stylus, creating art, and using it as a general asset holder and exporter. Talk about Photoshop and some of the bitmap effects that it's capable of doing. Fireworks, dealing with sprite sheets and editing a lot of graphics. After Effects, which is really good for doing text intro ideas, and it's mainly, it's massively awesome motion blur. Flash Builder for creating level editors using Adobe Air and the Flex SDK. Celtics, which is a great open source, well, it used to be, sort of, kind of, not really, for script writing. If you're doing dialogue or game dialogue, it's wonderful, and I'll show you why. If you're also doing storyboards, it's also great for that. Reason for Music. Reason is a really old music program that deals with a lot of uh, software synthesizers that emulate hardware. And if you're trying to get uh, music done for a pretty cheap price tag, it is awesome. There's a lot of others, but that's the one I choose to use. Audition is good for both music as well as music assembly, audio editing, and sound effects. If you have a microphone and you have a mouth and it can make weird noises, you're good to go. <laughs> All you need is Audition. Uh, Corona SDK is the current runtime and distribution mechanism I'm using. This is what actually builds and makes your game and what your game runs on. I'm using Corona SDK, but there's, this workflow will work for a variety of other platforms. You can use some of the things I'm talking about in Unity. Uh, you can use some of the things I'm talking about in Source SDK and a lot of the other ones. And finally, Sublime. Sublime is my editor of choice for Corona-type games and coding Lua. I've tried IntelliJ. I've tried the others. They just don't feel as good as Sublime and Quick. 
And finally, after all these tools, we're going to talk about some of the iteration points between them. Okay, so like when you use one, when do you go to the other one? So that's a lot to cover. And uh, like I said, if you want to skip ahead, I'll try to mark some of the things in the video so you can actually skip to the points you're interested in. Okay? So first, a crash course in Corona. So Corona, if you're not aware, is a program created by Corona Labs. And what they've done is it's a simple SDK that allows you to target the three main, or in this case, four main most important platforms. It's Apple, Android, Kindle Fire, and Nook. Believe it or not, there is a lot of money in these two for utility apps. The reason it's important is you have a single code base and a simple language that creates games that work on all four of those with the same code base. Now, most people have spent a majority of time on Apple and Apple alone. And the reason is, is that the statistics show that that's worth it. <laughs> that's where the money is, both in both games and in micropayments. That's where it is. There are a few app developers who've been pretty notoriously uh, successful in both Kindle Fire and Nook, and that's great. There's no reason that you can't do that as well. But statistically, even though there are a significantly more amount of Androids on the market, people who own them do not spend money. There's a variety of reasons for that. For now, Apple's the king, but if these things ever do get popper, hey, you're good to go. And besides, more audience is typically better, I think. Not to say that you know Objective-C can't rock it, but that's for another webcast. So Corona SDK, really all it is is a program that you run on your desktop, okay, or your computer. It's Mac or PC, doesn't matter. And you code in Lua, which is a lightly scripting language. It's very similar to JavaScript. And what Corona SDK will do is it'll build your code and make a little app for Android, and make a little app for iOS and Kindle Fire and Nook. It's up to you at that point to put it in the market yourself, to sign it yourself, or whatever else, to get it up there on the market, create all the marketing and everything else for it. So Corona SDK is lightweight, specialized, and rocks the mic. The reason Corona got popular was because a 14-year-old kid built a bubble ball game, and it quickly, uh, at least for a month or so, outstripped Angry Birds as the top iOS game. So that's why Corona got a lot of uh, press. Okay, Electronic Arts and a lot of others have started adopting the enterprise version of Corona to utilize its ability to talk to C or C++ or any type of extension that you can integrate with the device and yet have Lua and their wonderful engine on top. So Corona's gotten uh, a lot of love. But speaking of love, Love TV and Moi are other competitors that are very similar. They both utilize um, Lua to actually develop in. And one, I believe, is open source. Moi is another option compared to Corona. They have a lot of uh, wonderful APIs. And let's see if I can find Love 2D. Again, each one of these has a pro and con in terms of how much tooling is involved and things like that. Love's a little lacking, <laughs> but again, it's free somewhat. So to each their own, OK? So that's why I like those is because they have a built Box 2D physics engine built in that's fast. Lua is fast to iterate in. And the sprites and all that are GPU accelerated without a lot of brain power. Things like Flash and others take a significant amount of optimization time and things like that, which I'm just like not really interested in doing. That's not my thing. I don't get off on that. I don't want to spend time doing on that. So that's why I choose Corona. Besides, this is a hobby for me. I don't make a living doing it. I'm not an indie. And Corona is very low to get into. Okay, so that's your crash course in Corona. So let's talk about notes. Note is a notebook, okay? So you can get a good leather bound, unless you're, you know, a vegan. Believe it or not, I am eating vegan right now, but I'm not a vegan. So I will buy leather bound notebooks. So these things are wonderful. You keep a set of notes, sketches, ideas in them, and it's really quick, whether you use a pencil or a pen. And it's very cheap to create ideas and throw them away. Uh, it's very fast, you always have it readily available. You don't have to turn it on. You don't have to find it like you do on computer. So I highly recommend getting a notebook. You don't have to get leather bound. I just think they look cool and manly. And that's just my thing. Okay, so that's a great way to start. Another one is Evernote. And the reason Evernote is, is a great companion to actually these kind of things is because Evernote is everywhere. So when I'm dealing with multiple uh, clients, I love having Evernote because it's just it's wonderful for dealing with notes that I need to access anywhere. I can access them on my iPhone. I can access them on client computers. So if, if I go work for a client and they give me a computer, I can still access my same notes. doesn't matter where I am. And they're just wonderful for keeping those kind of things. So for example, here's my New Year's resolutions. I can access these anywhere. I can be aware of what I'm trying to do. 
and it helps me remember, like, what were my new resolutions? I can go look. What were my re- did I set any resolutions last year? Oh, yes, I did. How, how am I doing? It's the middle of the year, right? So these, this is why I like Evernote for those kind of things. And um, I can keep all kinds of ideas in here. It's just nice because when I write things down, I don't lose them. <laughs> like this, you know, outline for my Prezo this evening, like I could lose this. If I put it in here, I would never, ever lose it. I don't know why I don't do that. It's something I'm working on. But anyway, so Evernote's great for that. Another one is Trello. So Trello is a simple application to organize your projects. They call them boards. And what it allows you to do is have three or more columns to put tasks in. Now, if you've ever used something like Pivotal Tracker or Rally Dev or version one or any of the other plethora of project management tools out there, whether you're using Agile, Waterfall, whatever, they tend to be pretty in depth. They, ha- they tend to have a significant amount of tasks that are organized in certain areas and everything else. Trello is the exact opposite. Trello is supposed to be, for the most part, very simple with the minimal amount of team integration features, right? So you, you can actually work with other people. So as you can see, I have a pretty simple set of columns here, which is canned or things that just didn't make the scope cut for January. And um, this was not in the beginning, okay? This was during development of the game and during, you know, roadblocks and things that came up. I had to drag things there, you know, towards even the last week. Like, they're just not going to make the cut. I don't have time. I I didn't plan correctly. And that's one of the nice things about Trello is that at any time I can drag things if they just don't fit with my time frame. So you can create these cards, just really just tasks or items that you want to do. And as you can see, I've created all the green ones that are art-based, things I have to draw, things I have to paint, things I have to assemble from an artistic perspective. All the yellow things, all, they're called labels, by the way, are things dealing with code or implementation of code or something along those lines. Red has anything to do with audio, whether it's music, sounds, or some sort of foley. And there's other labels as well. If you go to labels here, you can see I've signed, signed Bugs the Yellow and... Uh, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with blue yet. So if you can't remember what you wanted to do with something, you can create a description. So I said this includes level pausing. You can also create a significant amount of things. You can also put due dates on them, attach files if you have design comps and things like that. I don't care about 90% of that. All I care about is I just had a significant amount of things I wanted to do, and I didn't want to forget them. This isn't necessarily a task list. This is more of a idea list that talks about devil in the details. So when you create a game, one of the biggest issues you have is scope creep. And it's not just a at the beginning of the month thing where you have an idea and it you know snowballs into something more complex as you really develop the concept and like it. Trello really helped me organize on a day-to-day or even just weekly perspective. Like if I, I just come to Trello sometimes just once a week. Where am I at? Where did I leave off? What really is missing? I've hit a brick wall in a certain section. Is there another task that I can fall back to? So, for example, I was hitting a brick wall with some of the artwork because I wasn't sure how it would work, so I just put it off. And I came back to it a week later and dragged it into, you know, I'm doing it right now, right? And some of the other stuff on the code things, I hit brick walls. I put those back in this to-do. I worked on them a little bit, right? And I left notes for myself on where I left off, and I came back. So I just felt like Trello was really helpful to see, you know, what I have done, in fact, what what is my game theoretically showing right now? What things do I have to accomplish? And what's left? And also, this has helped me really understand, like, what does the, the, a task really mean? When I say code an enemy or a code a weapon, how much time is really involved? What's the effort level? How much stuff do I really have? So now when I do another game for February and March and the rest of the year, I really have a better understanding of what that really means from a scope perspective and what kind of notes I need to leave for myself if I've basically paused it or whatever, I need to come back to it later. So Trello is just something that's really simple to help me organize my tasks, remind me of where I'm at, and give me a a good understanding of what the scope is at at any given time, not just at the beginning, but whatever else. From a projection and metric perspective, not really, but that's not what I'm interested in since the game can change at any time. So that is basically Trello. And again, you can change the name of these columns if you want to. You can add a particular card. If I want to say I'm also working on uh, a video for my progress in one game a month. Just hit add. And 
and I'm almost done, so I'll drag that to done. And it has an activity of all the things I've done, so I can see where I left off. You can also filter those particular cards. You can add other members if you, if you are working with other people. And I might not finish this video, so I can put it again, but that's basically Trello. Now, Flash is actually a massively wonderful asset container, an asset exporter. So you can't you can do artwork in Flash, but you can also organize the majority of your artwork in a single file, or at least create a starting point of where you're actually going to go. So what I've done with Flash is create a significant amount of artwork, both for title screens, for game sprites, for GUI controls, or even just simple you know quick game art to knock it out. Game art which is slightly different than actual production art. It means it's just a placeholder graphic, okay? It's something that you can put code around, make it work, and then later, come back and make it look good. Or if it looks reasonably good, you don't have to touch it, cool, you're done. You could also come back and polish it later or change the design if you don't like it. But the point is, you need to create something quickly and get up and running. And Flash is a wonderful tool to do that. Because it's vector, you can... Um, basically infinitely zoom on that so let me show you what that means unlike bitmap which is made up of square pixels vector allows you to zoom in and not lose resolution and as you can see all the items are anti so these little fans on top of this uh, online generator you can see the control tower the little satellite dish the planes I can continue to zoom on on these right if I zoom in really far you can see I still got you know, infinite detail. So you can continually zoom in and create that. Additionally, Flash works with a stylus. So you can create just about any drawing you want. It's pressure sensitive as well. So if I get a bigger pin here, I can draw really light lines. I can draw really thick lines or really thin lines, right? And the reason a stylus is neat is that... Let's create a new one and I'll show you. This is uh, another extension of your notebook right so in the beginning you can create a significant amount of ideas and generate from this so for example let's say um, I have an idea about a character or I have an idea about a story or I have an idea about a game mechanic type that I want to try so I've always wanted to try an RPG 2d overhead with the square tiles right which has like that and I don't really have an idea but I know I want to do that type of game so I have to think you know what what is a character doing so we have a character okay so we have a character how did he get there maybe he has a sword okay so this character has a sword and um, he's walking along and there's mountains in the background and maybe there's a meteor that hits the earth or hits the planet that he's on and it crashes and makes an explosion and a dragon uh, comes out okay so this dragon says that actually he's not a mean dragon, but he, he talks to you. And his home, or his spaceship, crash landed over here, and you have to go rescue the spaceship or something. You and the dragon are together, and that's how you, your game starts, right? So these kind of things allow you to make create ideas. Um, you can quickly create buttons. You know, placeholder art. Here's new. So now I have a new button. Done. Very important for any design to basically be designed for the device that you're targeting or the platform or technology that you're targeting. So you're not going to build a bunch of 2D art for using Unity unless you're creating something like Paper Mario or some kind of side-scrolling game that has a very you know, 2D feel with like a 3D uh, environment, right? So I know that I'm doing a box 2D game and I want to create a joint-based boss. So these arms I'm going to have to recreate or redesign once I get the idea down into actual joints. He has an elbow, he has a shoulder, he has a wrist for these particular arms to work. So I can play with that in Flash and figure it out. But when it comes to actually creating sprite sheets, so here is one of our bombers. This is kind of an in-boss. And you can tell that he's already got some damage. I basically took the original sprite and I, I basically uh, you turn the pin over and you can erase parts of the plane, right? So I, I, I erase parts of the plane, and up here I have flames and smoke on a completely different layer. And if you can see, if I go frame by frame, I can create different flames and smoke, but they're on a different layer, so they don't affect the original drawing. What's cool is that because they're vector, I could scale this up or down 
and then once I export it out, it converted to pixels, right? So it doesn't matter how big I make it. If I wanted to make a bigger boss that was just a bomber that was really big, I could scale this one up. So let's talk about scaling real quick. I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to do an Apple A to select all this. And go to a new flaw. Paste it. Export the image as a ping, which Flash does really well with pings as well. And let's go to the plane shooter and make a new test folder. Call this the bomber. Now notice I'm saying minimum image area with 24 bit with alpha. I want to retain the alpha channel. You always got to make sure that's defaulted. When I go back to fireworks and I actually open this up, I want to show you something. So notice how it's gotten more pixelated now, right? So you can't tell at this, but when the phone upscales or downscales your graphics, you'll be able to see the pixelization occur. If we're trying to shrink this down, there's an algorithm that you can actually use. And there's two ways to scale something. So let me show you. We'll go to image size. We'll deselect it. Now Photoshop does this as well. And as usual, a little bit better. There's some things that Fireworks shares with Photoshop, but some things they wrote on their own and they're just not as good. Um, nearest neighbor preserves hard, hard edges. Nearest neighbor is a good pixel scaling algorithm for doing game art, right? So it'll make sure that it gets that pixelated feel. So if I want to scale it down, let's say to half the size, okay, 71, and we'll constrain proportion so it'll automatically handle the height to be the exact same size it's supposed to be. Now that, that'll scale down halfway. It looks a, a little bit better because it actually retains the hard colored edges. So if we undo that, and we go and scale it down to 71, but we do by cubic, right, which is really good for smooth gradients. You'll see it kind of blurs it out, right, and washes out the color. So you want to do nearest neighbor if you're going to scale things up or down to kind of retain those hard edges and those colors. Because uh, otherwise, it'll start to anti-alias and blur things out, and that's not what you want. You want nice, crisp graphics with hard edges, unless it's for smoke, obviously. Now, it's a little easier to deal with these pixels and fireworks, but you're more than welcome to use Photoshop, which also has a good nearest neighbor algorithm as well. And the other good thing that Flash is good for is painting. You can paint vector things on top of graphics. I actually took a picture of me. I painted over myself, made myself look like a pilot. And all I did was take some images that I found online, paint paint their likeness, right? Because I'm not I'm not that that good of an artist. But a lot of these uh, explosions you can draw in here. It's a lot easier to scale things up and down and move them around without having to be tied to a particular pixel size. When you paint things in Photoshop and other bitmap editing tools, it's not really easy to scale them and retain that. There you go. So here's the original headshot that this is gleaned from, right? You can see I'm a fat programmer. Not anymore. I'm a lot skinnier. Thank God. Yeah, and here's the flight goggles that I based them on. Right? And these were originally taken from, a, I think, a French pilot. And these were just drawn from there. I just traced their likeness. I can actually paint on top of this to get the general. Let's get black so you can not wash it out as much. There you go. You can see I got the start of the goggles, and you can fill them in. When you use um, vector fills, they're a little different than bitmaps in that they can deal with holes a little bit better. Right? So see there's a hole up there, but it was managed to fill it. There's a hole here, but it'll manage to fill it if you turn the tolerance down. Now one of the strengths of Photoshop, obviously, is to edit images. You take a photo, and it's in a shop. Photoshop. We have a nice picture here taken with a reasonably good camera. You can see some attempt at bokeh here. <laughs> okay, so it's at an angle, a little artistic. It makes the uh, the user, the viewer, look at it as a little skewed. It looks like the building is not only just old and weathered, but some kind of the angle really makes you feel awkward. It makes you feel like you don't want to look at it that way. It makes the building almost like control the angle you're looking at. It just makes you feel uncomfortable, right? And this is the kind of photo we want. What we're going to do is we're going to change the colors. An easy way, we're going to go to Image, Adjustments, 
and what I like to call is hue and saturation. So the great thing about saturation is a way to get black and white images without actually affecting the original image. So just to be uber effective, we're going to duplicate the layer, cancel it, hue and saturation, and turn saturation down, and voila, black and white. Then, my favorite, this is my favorite, okay, I do this everywhere. We can use the same technique we showed you earlier to soften it up a bit. Turn the opacity first, down to about 80, 88 on that second layer. Then we'll go to filter, go to Gaussian blur, of about, let's say, 8. There we go. And then, notice it's already looking kind of spooky. Okay, now we're going to get an overlay. And let's see if we can turn it up. It's not so prolific on black and white, but you can see the shadows are really pronounced. So this is a great for a zombie game. All right, so here's the bomber sheet. Now, the reason I like Fireworks as opposed to Photoshop is it has this object editing thing. Now, Photoshop has this as well. You'll notice if I actually click on the objects, I can see what they are if they were single objects, and it has these little handles. The problem with it is, is this not as quick, as fast as Fireworks? And it doesn't handle text as well either. I can use the brush tool on individual pixels, and Photoshop has really accurate brush tools and pencil tools but I just like fireworks for actually quickly doing it and the reason that's important is that ping is a native format for fireworks people s seem to think that that's not really an important fact but it is I can save and open this format and keep all my layers and vector editing data retained I cannot do that in Photoshop when I open this sprite sheet as you saw in Photoshop it was one sheet right all the layers are flattened it just doesn't know how to deal with the metadata that fireworks actually adds to a ping file when I save this ping file I can use it in any program that's capable of using a ping it'll open it and read it namely Corona SDK but when I open it back in fireworks it manages to retain all the layers and vector data that I associate with it right so I really like that now the guides aren't as good as in fireworks as they are in Photoshop, but you can still sp specify particular locations of the guides so you can align your sprite sheets to pixel perfection. And the guides will actually be saved with the ping but won't show up in the final file. So that's, that's what's really nice about creating sprite sheets and dealing with bitmap editing, editing data in fireworks as opposed to Photoshop is that these kind of edits and deal with sprite sheets uh, attained. Now, I don't have time to show you right now, but there is um, a scripting engine just like Photoshop where you can create commands. And these allow you to actually write in JavaScript to automate the process. So I've written some commands to help automate sprite sheets because doing the measurement of creating a sprite sheet is a royal pain. So as you can see, the sprite sheet is a normal damaged and uber damaged bomber and you can see the flames are actually a completely separate layer right so this is nice I can actually play with them do with effects I can even add glows if I want to take this back this uh, particular flame thing into Photoshop and add some flame glows into it I could if I had the time and I highly recommend doing that in Photoshop because it's it's glows are superior to the effects here now fireworks does have Photoshop live effects which is really for compatibility between the two but it just feels and looks like Photoshop is a superior interface and actually dealing with those kind of things. So this goes back to the intra-application workflow as to why you would use photo Photoshop as opposed to Fireworks and vice versa. Photoshop is superior in dealing with image editing. Fireworks is superior in dealing with object editing. Okay? So that's Fireworks in a nutshell. See if there's anything else I wanted to tell you about Fireworks. Nope. That's it. <laughs> you can uh, open some of the actual objects in here. If I wanted to uh, edit the bullet, let's say I couldn't see it, right? It's just a bunch of, you know, image. I could actually increase the size of it really quickly by doing an image size of, let's say, 8.8. Eight. The user can't see it, and there you go. Let's uh, let's go to B and darken up these, these oranges here. So instead of getting this little anti-alias effect, let's actually make it a fully pixelized version. Get the yellow. Get rid of this half anti-aliased anti version, okay? and do some white get rid of this anti-alias version whoops whoops it's tired there we go it's late and i'm tired <laughs> cool and there you go it's a bigger bullet hopefully it's easier to see on higher density screens where the game scales up so this uh, particular bitmap will be easier to see see pretty simple stuff and you can hit save and it's ready to use in your game okay so let's talk about after effects the first thing after effects is good at is creating effects and doing 
composition on them from a video perspective. So what does that really mean? Well, After Effects was traditionally supposed to be used after a video editing program such as um, Smoke or Flint or Avid and you would take those videos and composite them on top of other videos. After Effects got really popular because unlike the very expensive Avid system, After Effects was used to create the very famous ramen noodle or ramen, sorry, ramen noodle, I'm tired, ramen noodle commercial or the intro to movies such as uh, intro for the Avengers. So After Effects got a lot of popularity because of that weapon upgrade in the game that you can get which is called a railgun. Now a railgun, if you're not aware, generally speaking, fires a laser beam. It's just light. It's all it is, a normal laser. that is a, 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 a beam of light from point A to point B. And what it does is whatever point it touches, it ionizes the air between where you are and the laser starts and the laser ends, whatever you're pointing at. Once that air is ionized, it performs a nice path for an electrical charge to be passed. In this case, an extremely powerful one, such as a lightning bolt. And that's what a railgun is generally works upon. So in this case, the plane has a railgun. It can do the same thing. You can't actually see the laser, but you can see the lightning beam. Now, creating light effects such as this in Photoshop can be done, but they can't be tweened over time. It's really hard to create animations. Now, there are some awesome people that can do it. I'm sure there might be superior reasons to why you would do it that way in Photoshop, but I choose to use After Effects just because it's really quick. I can tween things. I can move these little tween points around, and it's a non-destructive editing way as compared to something like Flash, which also has you know primitive bitmap editing capabilities for these kind of things. So in here, I can create a lightning bolt around a beam of light and create a railgun with glows and everything else and export that out as a ping sequence and use that in Corona SDK. Now, I think that looks smoking hot. I can add some sound effects to it, and you know it looks hot. I actually have a YouTube video of how, how this railgun works. But After Effects is just great for editing the individual frames over time. You don't even have to do that. You can actually create the animation. So you can see all I did to generate this was I created a solid. If you're not aware of a solid, it's just, uh, I'll show you what it is. So let's create a composition. Composition is like kind of like a movie clip in Flash or a movie if you're used to other video editing things. It's a blank slate, okay? You create a layer. In this case, it's a solid. So I'm going to say it's a uh, dark gray solid. doesn't really matter. I'll choose red so we can see it, okay? Now, whatever we render on this solid for effects, you need to have a solid to render effects. So we'll go to simulations. Particle Playground is a wonderful. Oh, I could do a whole video on Particle Playground. But let's talk about, where's Generate? So Generate, we'll generate a beam, a beam of light. Now, a beam has a variety of properties that you can play with. Now, what does that mean, properties? These properties allow you to change the way the beam looks, such as where does it start, such as where does it end. Right? Notice the beam's changing in direction. How big is the beam between those two points? How long does it take to get there? Is it is it halfway between the journey or whatever else? What's the thickness of the start? What's the thickness of the end? What if we lower that down? Is it like a point? Does it rotate? Right? Does it have some kind of that? The inside color is window color, which is kind of a, a deep... I think it was a deep purple. I can't, I'm not that much of a geek. I can't remember Mace Windu's... Lightsaber, lightsaber color, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, cool, Mace Windows lightsaber. So is it like that? Does it have some kind of 3D perspective or not? Is it 2D? And uh, whatever that means. So you can tween this. Now you notice the red disappeared, right? It's really compositing this generated effect on top of it. So at this point, you don't even care what the original solid was. We can just call this our light. Now why? what do these properties mean? You can tween over time any one of those properties. Now what does that mean? Well, let's start with the link here. And we'll go in 50, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. This is a little, little too high here. Let's scroll down to about 10 seconds. And you can change this in the composition settings. If you want your effects to only be about 10 seconds long, which most for games that you can export as the ping sequence are, you know, you don't have to deal with this. You can just create, when you create the composition settings, ah, Apple K, excuse me. Uh, notice that its duration is a minute and 17 seconds. You would want to default it to 10 or something or 15 just to play around. All right, so we're going to change the length to 100%. Now, notice this keyframe I can move. It's it's great that it's non-destructive, unlike Flash. Flash has an option to do this kind of editing, by the way. So point A, oops, point A, 
and point B. Pretty cool, huh? Now let's go. To, that's the length. Let's that's uh, undo the length. Let's make the length fifty percent of the actual journey. Now let's do the time. It starts here, and it takes two seconds to go to here. Starts at zero. There we go. Now you'll see in green there, it's actually pre-rendering that effect. Uh, some of these things are, are cached. So if you see the green, you know that you can then hit spacebar and it'll show immediately, right? You don't have to actually let it pre-render. Now let's speed this sucker up a bit. We'll move it down here so it takes about less than a second to get there. Why is that important? Well, this goes back to what is the other amazing thing about After Effects is the motion blur that it actually does. If you check this, it means this layer is motion blurred. So anything that moves on it, it'll pre-calculate a motion blur. You then say enable motion blur for the entire movie. And anything that has this you, will be enabled. The reason that you want to check this on and off is that motion blur takes forever to render. So if you want to sit here, you'll be waiting forever to preview a very complex composition. So for now, we'll turn this off. We'll turn it on so if we can, you can see it's a little bit. See, see how it's blurring there on the edge there? There you go. See how that's working? So this this applies to anything that moves. And this is why After Effects is amaze balls. So let me show you a new composition. So let's say you have an ending where you're, or even a, a power, where the plane goes to warp speed. I'm not saying the plane does go to the warp speed, but if it did, it would look kind of like this. And import it into After Effects with an Apple I. Where's the player? There he is. Open that. Okay. So you have a brand new project. I'm going to drag the player into the timeline. Okay. So you have a player here. Right. He's right there. Now I'm going to make a new composition. It's 640 by 480. Usually an iPhone is actually 480 by, it's not an aspect ratio. We don't care. We're just doing phone animations, you silly goose. By 640. Okay. So you zoom out a little bit. That's about the size of an iPhone. It's a little bigger, but whatever. Close enough. So keep in mind our Corona stuff's got a scale. So we're just going to play in the middle here. Now if you take a simple bitmap, in this case it's just a ping. Now you don't have to put it in a composition. You can use the ping itself. And I'll do that so I don't confuse you. Okay, so we have our little ping right here. Now why does it look all pixelated? Well, that's sometimes because A, you're zoomed in, and B, you might have the resolution down to speed up your renderings, okay? This won't affect your output unless you specifically say that. So for now, we're going to keep everything at full to make it look awesome. We're going to turn our motion blur on. Okay, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to put this guy right here. So he's going to go about, I would say, 80% of the screen. I'm going to zoom in so I don't have to see the whole thing here. Let's move our workspace down a little bit. And then zoom in time to about a second. So within half a second or less, this guy is going to go from there to there. So we're going to use the normal tweening properties. This is just like you would tween in Flash or anything else. It's based in that. Do position. And within 10 frames, he's going to go way up here. Okay. Let's undo that. Uh, no, that's good. That's good. Go back. I forgot to make a keyframe. If you forget to make a keyframe, you can just actually click this thing right here, and it'll make a keyframe. But we want his keyframe to start there, okay? So see this little set of dots? This is actually, each one of these dots is a point in time. Unlike Flash, it's, I mean, it's a point in time, right? Now you can actually grab this thing. It's, it's actually a Bezier curve to make him curve. We're not going to deal with that right now. But all these properties can be tweened, okay? Now the reason that's important is that if you go to this mode, you can actually deal with easing on a very weird, weird way. So we want him to... Actually, do a tween in like that. So see how he's he's easing into it. He's going right, right, and then he just flies at the last second. Okay. So we'll go back to our normal turn off graph editing, so we can actually just do normal timeline animations. And let's you know what? Heck with ten frames. How fast would he do if he did it in one half of a second? Okay, that's a little aggressive. We'll go to 10 again. Okay, let's turn this off. Turn this down. Let's see how, how it goes. Whew. That looks hot. Now see how it's doing the motion blur for you? Right there. I mean, look at that. That motion blur is the best motion blur you're going to get. It's better than fireworks. It's better than Photoshop. After Effects is the ultimate.
So when you go to export ping sequence, you need to remember that pings by default are 24-bit images, aka they are bitmaps, right, that don't have any compression other than uh, an improved LZW. It means it takes no quality away from the image when you save it. However, pings also have an option for compressing an alpha channel with that. So you need to make sure when you choose channels, it's RGE, RGB plus alpha, okay? That'll give you millions plus colors, which is what you want, okay? Don't worry about format. Just choose these two. Good to go. Say okay. Just in case there's anything in there beforehand, let's, uh, let's make sure. Okay. Click render. Voila, it's done. And open this up as in preview. And as you can see, this lightning bolt has a nice little alpha channel, but it's still got the blur. Looks good, right? So you don't have to use all these frames for the lightning bolt. You could in a sprite sheet. Nine isn't, you know, ten isn't un unreasonable, right, for a sprite sheet, but you could. So that's how you get nice little effects out of After Effects from just playing around with the particle effects. The particle effects, oh, God, they're amazing. I, I, I suggest you have an entire day to spend playing with those things. There's a lot of great tutorials on YouTube as well for that. All right, so that's brief on After Effects. Someday I'll show you a particle playground. I'll probably link to a cool one you can actually export pretty easily for using for jets or f extra cool flames from if you're making a rocket pack game or a rocket game or a car game or anything cool with flames or smoke. All right, so let's show you Flash Builder. So Flash Builder, before November 9, 2011, was pretty much my entire career. Um, then Adobe decided that Flash didn't matter anymore. So ever since, it's kind of gone downhill. The Apache F Foundation has done a wonderful job of taking it over. But unfortunately, from a marketing perspective, no one's done a good job. So most people, from an enterprise perspective, don't care anymore. But what's great about Flex and Adobe Air in general is it is a wonderful way to make quick, simple apps that run strictly for you, and you can quickly create a GUI around it. And what that means is, is that you have the ability to create GUI controls pretty quickly, but also custom things, anything that Flash can do, both from a vector and a bitmap drawing perspective, which means it is ideal for creating level editors. And the fact that it can now output and read back JSON is an ideal scenario for creating level editors for Corona. So here is a level editor that I've created for the plane shooter. And I've shown this in other videos, but I'm just so I'm gonna go pretty quickly here. But it allows you to open levels and edit them. Here, let's open level one for the game. So this level, and it's actually hard to see on the screen, but there's a timeline down here and I'll show you in another video, which you can scrub to see uh, the time of the video. You can edit the name, the description. Uh, you can choose the music that the actual level has. And each one of these items over time, I can create a new one and edit it, right? You can see the plane right there. I can move it around where it's actually going to appear on the screen over time and at what time it appears. And does it pause the game when it actually goes? If I want to edit an actual a movie, a movie is a dialogue between two characters. And I can say who the character was, the emotion, what they actually say, if they have an audio file that works with it. Does it automatically play, meaning they don't actually have to press a button to hear the audio? And if it's done, does it automatically go to the next piece of dialogue, or does it wait for the character to take an action, right? And if it doesn't, how long does the audio last, just in case if it's an auto playback and it doesn't want to take the end of the actual audio? So these are a movie. And again, these are just simple GUI controls. And at the end of the day, this outputs a, job, a JSON file. And I'll show you what that looks like in a bit. But you can write this all in ActionScript and Flex, which is very similar to JavaScript. It just has strong typing. If you're familiar with TypeScript, it's about the same thing. If you know Java, you already know ActionScript. <laughs> so that's uh, pretty much the gist of that. You can pretty quickly lay out GUI controls. Sometimes you can even preview them, which is gone in new versions. <laughs> but uh, the point is, is that all the simple controls that you need such as a button uh, such as a what's the other one radio buttons select buttons they all are here and they work on both Mac and PC so it's it's nice to create easy quick level editors that work for cross-platform so the only thing that this actually shares with anything else beyond the JSON level file that outputs obviously is in the assets I'll sometimes copy some of the uh, characters over, such as the bomber, the jet, missile, and things like that. So when I'm creating a level, I can place them wherever I want. So it, it gives me kind of a real-time preview of where they would actually appear if you look on that screen on the right. Okay. The second thing you can use 
flash butter or even flash you don't have to use flash butter right I like flash butter is creating generative art so if you have backgrounds that have a lot of repeating things and you're trying to deal with z depth instead of copy and pasting trees or clouds or things like that you could just do generative art and actually export it out to a bitmap file so in this case i can draw some trees that are random each time doesn't matter and then hit save and i can actually save out a ping of whatever that is so we'll go to plane shooter make another untitled folder called trees or tress <laughs> hit save and it's a nice little ping that i can use in the game and now obviously i'll take this back Photoshop, as you saw before, add a little Gaussian blur to make it a little blurry, a little, you know, colors brought out a little more, maybe add a background with a little uh, noise, sometimes a despeckle noise, depends on what you're going for, right? So that's that's another neat thing that you can do with Air, Adobe Air, is actually output generative art pretty quickly to a local file that you can then play with in your app. Next up is something called Celtics. Celtics is a script writing software. Originally, I think was open source. But uh, it's used for everything. So if you missed that screen, I'll show that again. In a new project, you can, it's for film, for theater. You can do storyboards, even comic books and novel. But the reason I like it for just doing the default is that it has the script writing format. Now, I went to art school, and one of our classes is script writing. They taught us this very specific format. Apparently, if you violate this, it's really bad. For me, it's pretty obvious. This is the scene. This is the character, all in caps. These are their lines, which are slightly indented next to it. If you have any notes about the scene, you can write that. Right? These are production notes, basically for you, in parentheses in the middle. And these are really sounds or scene changes, but I, these, in this case, they're sounds. Right? They're underlined, and they specifically say sound. I can see every scene or level of the game over here and quickly actually go to where it starts. So if I'm dealing with dialogue on a particular level, um, this is where it comes from. And if you look at my original from my notes, my storyline, where the plot, the narrative hook, the actual climax, and the resolution occur, you can actually quickly jump to those points. And if, you know, from a high level view, you see how your story is actually progressing. Um, if you do dialogue, you do a run through with whatever your voice talent is, maybe that's you, maybe that's your friends, maybe that's somebody you actually hired and paid money to do, you can pretty quickly from a high level view see if that dialogue works and if not change it and this is your dialogue file I actually have this checked into github just like any other text file and it acts as a binary file there because <laughs> github doesn't know what it is but um, I think the reason is that you can actually embed images and things like that so if you go to your index card or if you're doing the storyboard mode you can actually embed images in there to actually show what it would look like me I'm just using the script okay now the reason this is important if you're doing dialogue and audio recording is that you can actually go to the reports and look at all the lines a single character has. What scenes they occur in and what they say. So when I'm doing dialogue, I can actually go down each one of these and record just that character's dialogue. And that's it. Now, unfortunately, I can't click and go, but I can at least see generally what scene it's in and go find it. So if I have to go back and change a piece of dialogue and say I find a... A misspelling or I just I say the line or the character who's recording says the line says you know I don't feel like this is what the character would actually say or this is how they would act I think they would act different right you have the opportunity to change it here so Celtics is really just an advanced te text editor really but these reports are invaluable for quickly finding every single line a character is supposed to say you can run through the recording of that and then come back Sometimes you might have all the voice talent in the studio in the same day, and that's fine. You know, you can do that as well. But for me, it was just nice to have it nice and organized. This simple little feature saved me tons of time to, you know, quickly go down things. If I found a spelling error, I could come back, rerun the report, right? So Celtics is really good for generating that. You can also export this out as a PDF to share with your friends if they don't actually have Celtics installed to read it and say, hey, what do you think? Does this story sound compelling? Uh, is this something you would say in a zombie apocalypse? This is just, it's great for getting your ideas down, for organizing them, pointing out major plot holes. <laughs> Once you read it, you're like, how does that character even know? Or why would the user even care about this character? Have I not introduced him, you know, soon enough or late enough, right? You can quickly see where that comes. And that's, again, part of the point of the reports is that you can do that. Another, so before we get into what we actually do with dialogue, let's talk about music production. Now the pros to reason that it at first looks very intimidating because it actually emulates sometimes new and custom made up, sometimes real hardware in 
has a lot to do with audio engineering. So this is really more not just about audio production or people who produce music, but more so from audio engineers, people who deal with the electronic and the the science around audio waves and things like that. So it can be intimidating, but don't worry, okay? Additionally, the timeline tends to be a little more, I don't know, complex and supporting of old ways such as block editing mode for ways that people used to do music, and you still do today. But it just it doesn't really deal with a lot of the improvements that have happened over the years. But at the end of the day, it is a wonderful, wonderful way to generate sounds and play with those sounds and create really unique soundscapes. And you can also create really compelling compositions in here. But most importantly, it supports MIDI. So you can actually connect your external instruments up, a guitar, if you have a keyboard, you can play with whatever else. If you don't have any of that, like me, you can actually use the built-in keyboard. And you just press F and it can actually generate sounds. Let me open a, a song that I did for level one. So Jungle Run is supposed to be a kind of a jungle, you know, it's got like a jungle feel. You're flying over jungle. You're dealing with a really wild place. It's a very quick and fast, you know, raw. So I had to have the whole bongo element with the the build of a really ethereal element at the end because there's a huge, big, advanced surprise at the end of the level. So I had to have that composition complete, you know, kind of complete that feeling for the user that's playing the game. Additionally, I had to do it in three days. <laughs> that was my limit for one game a month. I said, I have to complete a song in no more than three days. That means production, that means editing, and that means actually getting it into the game and working. <laughs> so it, it seems like a lot of time it's not to create a song. So a lot of it's going to be very cliche. So all you need to know is most songs have to have a beat. They have to have usually something by four by four. What that means is, is that every measure or time of a song you're going to hear four beats so da 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 right i just did eight beats over two measures which is four by four that's how most techno and everything else is done okay so there's this wonderful thing called redrum redrum is this nice little instrument that allows you to play drums so we have a nice little house beat here so let's hear it now again the concept for level two was kind of a bongoey jungle right now we have something called a house kit now house music traditionally has bongos and a hi-hat and some kind of bass line right i'm going to press it every time i want to hear it i can also use my keyboard sometimes so what happens with the house kit is also is included with congos all i wanted was the congos so that's all i use one thing about reason it's always going to match the time scale you have most songs are 120 but i wanted this tempo to be a little bit higher so i did 130. most dubstep or rap beats are going to be around 60 to 80. so i wanted this one to kind of be you know a little drum and bassy a little little high high intensity high you know nervousness right because you're out in the middle of nowhere you don't know where you're going that really pumps the blood up right so we're going to hit run and you can see that each one of these beats on this particular track right here Okay, I'm going to solo it so you can hear just it. It's going to play one beat every four measures, okay? And we'll go to each each step. This is step one through 16. Notice I have 32 total steps. I don't want a very boring drum. I want it to, instead of doing 16, I want to do 32. So, okay, so not much really interesting happening here. It's just a beat every four measures. Oh my God, it's not repetitive at all. So let's go to the second one. Unsolo it. Now this is a little harder hitting uh, bongo beat or conga, okay? Now when I select it, you can see that it actually changes the beats that are selected. So I have one, I have two and four, seven and eight, 13, but then on the first one, I have every other one, right? Really crazy. So let's watch this one in action. Okay, that's the first. These are the second steps. You hear that part where it's really quick together? Right. And you can do it all the way down the line to have, see, now notice how it's soft. It's, this one is not as soft, or I'm sorry, it's not as loud. See how I used a mixture of medium and soft, so it's not as loud. Now there's another drum set called the, uh, or I'm sorry, another instrument called the Kong drum, which allows you to do a different intensities of a drum. But this is a pretty simple way to get a, a low, medium, and hard intensity of a drum. 
so you can kind of bring the beats up a little bit, right? So that's basically it. You can do this with multiple steps, right? See, soft kind of crescendos at the end there. Now, most of these instruments are MIDI-esque, which means they, they play instruments on themselves. So instead of actually exporting a WAV file from the sound that you're producing, right, an actual sound, you actually export the notes from the particular redrum. So you always use the timeline to select what instrument. You click it, it'll show you what instrument. It'll kind of flash it there. It'll also show you where and the volume control that you're dealing with. I'll get into tracks later, but basically, here's our beat, here's our notes, okay? And these are the different notes. You could play with it here if you wanted to, if you wanted to really screw with it, which I encourage. You should definitely, you know, screw up your beats a little bit. You don't want them too robotic. That's just my opinion. All right, so let's show you another one called Docto um, Octorex. The reason Docto Octorex is kind of cool is that you can get some pre-built songs and beats already made. You don't all actually have to use them in your song. They can actually give you ideas, right? Now, the basic bongo groove for this, out of edit mode, <laughs> so I can just see the track. So you'll notice Dr. Octorex already has something, right? So let's select him, see where he's at in the volume control, okay? We'll go up and we'll solo this guy because I just want to hear Dr. Octorex. Now, you hear that this is actually from a pre-built groove that they already did. It really gave me a lot of ideas. And you could actually play it with the other one as well, but I decided not to. I just wanted to get some ideas going in the beginning. Now these are patterns that you can play. Right now it has a couple patterns. If you click on it, you can see the other ones that it has for these kind of bongo-y kind of things. So Dr. Octorex has a lot of others. You can actually load up a Funky March. And you can play them with your keyboard as well if you want those particular notes. We can just run it and actually hear what it sounds like. So that's why Dr. Octorex has a lot more than just bongos, okay? But anyway, that's that's where I got a lot of my ide original ideas of how to play, okay? Let's unsolo that. So these are drums African. So I've got some African percussion, and I liked some of the notes that I heard. There we go. Okay. You can hear the, the nice reverb it has on it. Whenever they recorded this, it has some really nice echoey kind of background. It's got some good ambiance on it, right? Now, I could play it on different keys, too. Sometimes they include different instruments. Um, if you have a keyboard, it's easier. On, on here, you actually have to move to a different key and play around to so you can hear it, right? And you get the different bongos. So there's a lot of instruments, and I'm not really sure you know, how to play these on my keyboard. I'm just not that, I'm not a musician. And um, I've, I've watched my wife play piano a few times, but I'm not really a musician. So there's this cool little tool that'll automatically play patterns for you on a key without you having to manually do it. Now, yes, you can record these kind of things over time. Well, I can show that in another tutorial, but bottom line is the Matrix is wonderful for that. He has the ability to save a ton of patterns, too. So we'll look at number one's pattern. This is, all, all you do is you basically draw little blocks <laughs> on here and it'll play them. So let's watch. I'll hit run. Then you'll see it's playing 32 steps at 1 16th. And it's going to go over the whole thing. There's 32 blocks here. Now each one of these squares is going to play a note. See how it corresponds to this little keyboard over here? It's going to play a note. So when it hits this one, it'll play that. When it hits this one, It'll play the same thing, but notice when it hits this one, it'll go down a key. So instead of D or F, it'll go to D, right? So different note corresponds with a different sound. Whatever is loaded in this patch, whatever these patch are, you can even change this. Keep your same matrix pattern and play a dobruka, right? But I don't want that. I want to undo that. I want to go back to my African percussion, okay? All right, so that's that's the African percussion in the matrix. Keep in mind that these are the volume levels. You can actually right click. Yes, you can copy the actual pattern of it is, but you can randomize it. That that gets you some really, if you just don't know what to do, just randomize it. It'll put notes all over the place and in different keys, right? The low notes on some of the bass lines, not just for instruments. For instruments it's not a big deal, right? You're really interested in what what drum is mapped to what key. But if you're dealing with sounds, the matrix is amazing. I'll show that in a second. Okay? So this matrix is just really helpful if you're trying to play bongo drums with quickly just, you know, drag around the different levels to make certain 
louder and some smaller. You hear how they're quiet and then they come up again. Kind of add some attention. And you can change the pattern on the fly to play different drums. And notice this is only a 16 steps, right? So the matrix will save each one of these settings based on which uh, pattern you have. So the matrix is really cool to play with different songs if you suck at the keyboard like me, okay? <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about the good old Thor. Thor is an amazing uh, way to make sounds. Now here's the programmer for it. We're not going to mess with these, these parts, okay? But you can preload a lot of different sounds and everything else with different amounts and different effects and just tweak them to hell. We're going to hide this. Hide the module, hide the pitch bend, and just say Amber Fields. Okay, Amber Fields, that sounds good. Let's talk to me about Amber Fields. So down here, if I press a button, it'll play that particular key. In this case, the F key. So I'll go down to A. Or actually, you know what? I'll go to H. And you can hear it change pitch a little bit. Now go back to F. Ready? Now, what is Amber Fields by itself? Well, let's talk about that. If we go to Amber Fields and bypass all the effects that are played with it, that's what it sounds like with the alligator not affected to it. Now, a lot of these instruments can have things added onto it. In this case, the alligator is a great way to add echo to anything. And you can play with different echoes by holding it down and just loading different patches in there to see what it does. See, same sound with different patches. So I liked Amber Fields with this particular one in, these, in this particular key. And then you can record that particular key over time. So if you record, you can record yourself playing these notes. Or you can use, what? The Matrix, that's right. Now, I didn't use the Matrix for this one, but I did keep uh, pretty three notes for that. Electric uh, Monk, all right, this is a good one. So I took Thor again with the Electric Monk, and I added a ton of effects. First, Scream is the most disgusting dis distortion effect ever. It's great. So I'm going to bypass this, okay? And I'll see, here's, here's what it sounds like normally. It's called Electric Monk. Oh, wait, wait, different Thor, sorry. There we go. All right, different notes of Electric Monk. Very Portal-esque, right? Now, if you click, uh, let's turn on the scream that I added to it. Now again, you can click on any instrument and just go to Creative Effects and add one of these, like the Pulverizer, and it'll add it right below it. And if you ever don't know what it's actually attached to, if you're a geek, you can turn around and see, okay, is this particular scream matched to the mono left and right input of this? Yes, it is. Okay, and you can change these if you wanted to. You don't have to, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, so you can see where the wires are actually mapped. Again, you want to do that if you can't hear why is your scream not affected your Thor. All I did was hit tab to actually see the backs, okay? So, that's Electro Monk with some distortion. Now again, off, on. All right, it's just gross, I love it. Now, added with some pulverizer, let's turn him on. It's very subtle, but you can hear it really destroys the original sound, which is great. Alright, now let's do a matrix on it. Remember this guy? You just put notes wherever you want. Now notice I turn the knob down to eighth, so it actually makes the note last a little bit longer. Now if you want, you can actually right click and you can copy these devices and tracks and, and make a duplicate and play around with it. But what you're really interested in is copying this pattern to track. And it'll copy that pattern down here so you can actually export it out, okay? That's how you get these kind of, I've got these three devices playing with each other. Do I have to record this in real time by pressing the keyboard? Like, like over here, do I have to go record? And then hit record, see how it's recording? Or not. Let's go turn off our drums before I drive myself crazy. There we go. Or do I just want to export out the matrix to the timeline and do that, right? As long as it's on for record. Either one, that'll get you done. So I could go on all day about all the instruments I did and all the effects I did. But all we really care about is what did I do when I recorded all this out? I didn't 
like assembling the entire song inside of Reason. I just don't. I've, I've, I grew up in Acid. I don't know if you're familiar with Acid and Soundforge. They were originally some older programs from, uh, I can't remember the company name back in the day, but Sony purchased them and kind of just put them on ice. They, uh, you know, updated them every so often, but they just weren't, I don't know. They were really cool when they first started. And the timeline controls they had were amazing. And when I came to Reason, I was really disappointed. I guess I had high expectations or a workflow that I preferred. Some people like this kind of timeline editor. Some people like Ableton, whatever. So I like to export each one of these tracks out and reassemble them in a multi-track editor, such as Adobe Audition, okay? So here's what it sounds like just flat out. You can hear that one lead is just really obnoxious. Let's see if we can find that guy and turn him off. Not him. Yeah, let's mute him, him. There we go. All right, so pretty cool. However, you'll notice that Again, I can have multiple drum tracks. I don't have to just one drums bongo. I actually have another one playing bongo beats. I have a bunch of different types of effects. And then, at the end of the day, I export it out. But I just don't like it in here. Now, some of the mastering is way better in here in Adobe Audition. So, that's music in a nutshell. Let's go show you Adobe Audition for both music production from a lot of the sounds generated from here. Not just music, but sounds as well. As well as sounds, Foley, things like that. The Audition is my new version of SoundForge. <laughs> when I came to Mac, I, I missed SoundForge. It's not the kind of program I'd actually run in Crossover. Um, I'd use Beyond Compare and Crossover and a few other minor Windows programs, but you know, SoundForge is my bread and butter for doing Foley work, right? Making making just a strange sound sounds from signals and you know sounds I record outside in the world, and I just missed it. So. Audition comes out and it provides both. It's great because it's both a, a wave editor. It edits you know sound files, creates MP3s, but it also does multi-track, which is what I was missing in Acid. So it does both things in the same program. Even better for game developers is it does batch processing, which is also a fantastic thing to have. So let me show you some of the sound effects we were dealing with in the audio world. So I'll take some of my dialogue. So I have some raw dialogue I recorded. And we'll open up these. Don't worry about the PFKs. PFKs are just uh, caches it does of the bitmap of the sound wave. All right, so I was trying to get my dog to bark because he had three lines in the entire uh, script. And I had to get him excited. There you go, you can hear him growling, right? And there you go, there's a bark, right? So you copy that out, do an Apple Shift in for a new audio file, it's mono, paste it in. Let's clean up the original file because we want as many low latency as possible. Keep in mind some Android devices to this day have low audio latency, so you want to give the start of the audio file as quick as possible. Perfect. Turn looping off. I remap W to go to the beginning of the file, hit spacebar to play. Good. Now, as you can see, it's a little loud, so let's turn down the decibels just a tad. There we go. Now, you can do all kinds of th cool things to them, so let's add this, make this stereo and add some depth. Now, there's a couple ways you can do that. Convert the sample type. Right, convert to sample type to convert to stereo, or you can do that and then save that as an action, either whether it's from your history or you know you do a, a bunch of steps that you actually like for recording a favorite. So if you want to start recording a favorite, anything you do in the IDE, for the most part, can be recorded. Some things can't. Me, I have a convert to stereo. I have a lot of other favorites I did. So for example, K, the main character of the game, is flying inside of a... P-38 Lightning, which is a World War II plane, which has a metal and glass canopy. Uh, the metal canopy 
is attached to, um, I believe it was a steel or aluminum frame, but the point was it was, it was actually pretty small for, for cockpits, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't very thick. So the acoustics are very bouncy and whatever else. For this game, she has a very upgraded plane, so it's actually a lot more thick. So I had to play around with the reverb and say, look, if she's in a, an upgraded World War II plane, the first thing you would reinforce is actually the canopy, right? You want the canopy to be better. Early in the war, in, in World War II, and this goes back to doing your research, uh, early in World War II, the, first, the biggest problem they had with the planes were those people who were doing high-flying missions or missions near um, the northern parts of Germany and Russia and Poland were freezing. <laughs> it was really cold in the canopy. Those who did missions in the uh, Japan theater with the Marine Corps, you know, helping the Navy and whatnot, they were hot as heck, right? <laughs> the canopy was really thin. So over time, the P-38 got a lot better. So this game, it was the same thing. I was thinking, okay, this is a more mature P-38. It's gone through some comfort factors. Uh, the main character... Uh, his father's running a cargo business. You would assume that this plane's for comfort, especially if he's willing to put his daughter in it, right? So, with all that said, what are the acoustics? Well, it's got to sound like she's in a bucket, sound like she's, you know, kind of in there. What are the reverb effects for it, right? So let's open up, uh, let's see, one of the audio files that Kay actually does, let's say. Flying carrier. He headed back to Empire's threaded carrier. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard. Very good. Okay. He headed back to the Empire. He headed back to Empire. There we go. It's good enough. We use that. Okay. Now it's mono. Let's get rid of some of the beginning parts. He headed back to Empire. Get rid of the end. There we go. So we have this audio file. It's not even normalized, so it's it's going to play a little too quiet. You kind of want it negative one or negative three, okay? So I have a few favorites I've saved for this. They basically do a, a bunch of real-time effects. Now, the way Audition works is it has two types of effects. You can render an effect. So, for example, if I want to normalize it or make it as loud as possible without making it clip, you don't want things to clip unless they're distortion, like music or something, like rock music. So we're going to go to... Uh, amplitude and compression, and we'll say normalize to 90% is what I like. Say OK, and it finds all the peaks and tries to bring them up. Unfortunately, it doesn't do it for this one for the high peak because it's higher. You can lower it and then do it again, but here's what it is normalized. You head back to Empire. That's a lot lighter, louder, and you can actually hear it, okay? The other way is to use the effects rack which allows you to do real-time effects and layer them, which is amazing. But the most important ones are echo and delay and the, I think it's the multiband compressor. Yeah, multiband compressor, which does a walkie-talkie effect, which actually makes it sound like she's talking from a walkie-talkie. We head back to Empire. We head. Right? So for K, I saved all those steps, and I call it K-voice. We head back to Empire. We head back See how it sounds like she's in a metal room? We head back to Empire. We head back to Empire. Now you got to do them in a certain order. Because some of these things, like you saw, remember how you couldn't do normalize? I actually had to make that a favorite and then do the effects and make that. So you have to do the favorites in a certain order. And some favorites you can't actually record doing multiple favorites in a row. It's frustrating. But anyway, first convert to stereo. Then we'll do her K voice. Then notice it slows it down a little bit, and then we'll do a. I like a normalized negative dB. That's a good one. We head back to Empire. We head back to Empire. So again, here, here's like she's in a room. No, O was the complete opposite. O is her, basically her dad, who's on the radio, and he sounds like a really old school crappy radio in horrible weather conditions. Okay, so O's was very challenging. I had to do a bunch of effects and play with different ones that I liked. What did it look like? There we go. That's a good one. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. What did it look like? What did it look like? Okay. It's a good start. So, first let's convert to stereo. What did it look like? Give it some depth. Next, we're going to do the, I think it was the delay. 
What did it look like? There you go. That adds adds a lot more depth to the the voice. What did it look like? I used to have it in stereo, but some sounds just don't sound with good with the delay. But vocals, it really adds depth. I don't know why. What did it look like? So all I did again was delay this by a few milliseconds. If you zoom in, like really far, <laughs> there's the top. I can actually copy this and move it. It's easier to do in multi-track. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can say undo that, copy just a mono sound, right click and say insert in a multi-track, creates a new multi-track session, save it wherever, say yes. I'm going to copy this one, put it in this track down here, okay, and I'm going to zoom in holding the command button, go all the way down here, and then move it just a little bit. What did it look like? Not enough. So let's go back. Move it a little bit more. Let's try that. What did it look like? That's a start. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Let's go there. What, what did it look like? Now, sometimes it's too much. But again, you get the point. You can tweak that to see how, how much echo you get, right? What did and Then go to... Convert to stereo. Add some delay. Now, I had a couple of radio files I liked, but this is the one that combined basically an. Here, I'll show you. It's a GXL radio. It's had a multi band compressor with uh, a walkie talkie that's been tweaked a little bit. Some distortion to make it sound like the, the radio is not doing so hot. Um, an FFT filter that is kind of like mastering for the vocals, so it really brings out his voice and kind of turns off all the background stuff. And with the distortion it, it in compressor already applied, the filter does some crazy stuff. And finally, the guitar suite for basically mastering bring, brought out, a, again, a lot of the high high pitches. I don't know why. It just sounded really cool with the retro low pass. It just sounded great. So when you actually apply that, I actually saved it as a favorite for two. Sounds like this. What did it look like? What did it look like? What did it look like? Now again, that whole sound, you could also apply um, Kay's voice to it, so it sounds like it's coming from her radio in her plane, but I just assumed she'd have headphones on, so I didn't want to overdo it. But if you if you did that, it would kind of sound like this. What did it look like? Right, and it, it has too many echoes and it's too hard to hear, so undo that. What did it look like? 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 So pretty cool. That's that's the basics of actually editing those. And I'd save those out inside the actual audio edited folder with each one of the lines that they've said. And these all match up with, remember, Celtics. That's right. So the script writing would have every line that they said, which number, and the first two words of whatever the line was. So when I'm actually putting this in the level editor back in Flash Builder, I actually know where they go, right? So that's that's generally the naming scheme I did. And each one of these, when I'm done, I would grab, let's say, I'll do three for now. Where is it? Or edit, I'm sorry, edit batch process. And drag those three files there. And if it was O, I just apply the favorite. You could actually apply the favorite if you say batch process. So like, you know, Radiofy 2. And then export it as an MP3 to wherever I want it and compress the file so it's easy to use on the phone, ready to go. Sometimes I used Wave for uh, sound effects, but in, for music and stuff, MP3, it's kind of big if it's a Wave, right? And it just batch processes them all out, and you're done. It's it's amazing. So that's that. Let's look at some more multi-track stuff real quick. So I had a guitar. I was making, uh, did power chords, you know, like punk rock <laughs> or uh, White Zombie or something like that. Just some really good you know, power chords, it just make, make, it's fun music, man, it's good stuff, and I played it with a dark flute, which you can actually generate from, I think it was either the Maelstrom or the Thor, in Reason, and it has a very ethereal sound, I did a pre-delay, remember, you know, you do the favorites delay, where you move the track, and brought it in here in the track, so, again, dark flute, and if you click here, you can pan the sound, the song down, so it kind of fades out, nice, instead of just abrupt quit, and then this guy, which is the warp speed. 
I lowered the pitch on that a little bit and then brought it in. Now the cool thing about addition is you can actually edit the source file by just double clicking it. So if you wanted to play with the pitch, um, you could do that. And that's what I did. Right? Just play it. If you speed it up or whatever. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna save those changes. I'll go back to the level in session though. And then the 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 uh, my daughter saying we actually did a manual delay of that. Wee! And I still kept her original effect on it when she's inside the plane. And finally, track five, which is the power chords. This is a guitar sequence I recorded out of reason. Right, it's just uh, all that is, if you want to see, by the way, is just a Stratocaster edge. Turn off the bypass here. Right. I used to play some chords. Alright. You put those chords through first a simple amplifier, okay, which has the presets of a tread plate. Right, it has some distortion you can play around with how much it is applied here to a simple guitar amp. Then you add some good old scream distortion. Overdrive sometimes cool too, but I like the distortion. And tweak some of those settings so it's not so obnoxious, or maybe you like it obnoxious. Love it. And then you just record that sequence going out, and it sounds something like. Right, and then you can play with the WAV file when you actually import it inside of Audition, right? So together, this is what happens when a level is ended. Right? And that's how you get a level in sound. Music editing using a multi-track editor. So this is the level 2 assembled in um, Audition. I already had all the music and reason, but I just didn't, I couldn't mess with it and screw it up. Like, you can totally screw with things in, in here. You can tweak, you know, all the... The like waves you just plaster them out, right? But you can't really cut them like you can here and play with the volume as, as quickly. Um, mess with the the pan and settings like that, and then just you know if you zoom in here and down here, like where I've created some transitions from vocals, you can play with the volume settings. It's just oh, it's so much more fun here. So so standard song. I can solo at any time. That's the good old matrix. That's me and the redrum. Redrum and the bagos. And what's cool is you go to the mixer. See, you can actually map some of those particular tracks. You can bus a series. Let me scroll down. You can bus uh, a lot of these to a particular level that you want on the mixer and apply effect just to those particular ones, then apply effects to the entire set, because eventually vocals is going to bust the master, right? So I, I want all drums to be a certain volume. I can bust those to the drum, right, which I had to the drums. I got I to gotta keep them up sometimes. Um, each drum I can affect individually, but I want to keep the drums kind of the, the main thing of the song, not the bass line, not the lead, not the vocals. So you can do all that. Like you could do this in reason, but I just it feels so much quicker here. I mean, maybe the output isn't perfect, but I mean it's electronic music, dude, on a phone. You know, on iPhone, on, on Android, it sounds good enough. It sounds awesome.
right? And some of those real time effects were actually from Audition. So I could do additional effects in Audition as well, not just do all effects and reason, right? So tag team it. And again, some of the effects in Audition are really great for that. And uh, at the end of the day, their mastering is okay. I'm not that good at mastering, so I don't even think I'll talk about that. So that is Audition and Reason working together to do sound effects. Let me show you some more sound effects just so you're like, okay, that. Let me, can I hear some more? Here is the tank announcement when the big tank man at level 2 comes out. And all that was was a horn, added some echo delay to make it sound electronic with some chorus, which makes it sound even more electronic with some distortion, and then added echo on top of that to make it sound like it was there, and finally reverb on top of that, uh, which I think is JXL Honk, I think. Yeah, JXL Honk. So let's hear what, hear what it is both. It's got to pre-render these effects. You'll see down here it's cat. Oh my god, I could do this all day. Oh, I love it. So that is, um, okay, one more. <laughs> Just one more. Uh, let's see, there's got to be another one you haven't heard. Oh yeah, here's the carrier. I like this one a lot, actually. So the carrier, I assembled some air traffic control tower sounds from Australia, I think, and France, and some military chatter and then put some reverb on it so it sounded like you were uh, with machines, like you were inside a flying carrier, kind of like the thing from Avengers. So he had carrier interior, right? Which is, I believe, a Maelstrom a machine sound that I added some... I, I actually slowed the pitch considerably in Audition and I added a compressor to make it sound kind of tinny. And this is the uh, military sounds with the air traffic controller snippets I took out. And I think I had a gate. Right, with a tad uh, bit of distortion on a few of these. Right, and some noise reduction on some of them because they needed a gate badly. They were um, added them together, slice and dice. And lo and behold, you have. Where's the carrier? Yep, this one. See, it sounds really different when you know how it's made. <laughs> because then you're like, wait a minute, I can hear these all effects creating this composition together, right? All right, so that's enough of Audition. All right, so here I'm going to show you level two a little bit. I'll show you what happens when you put everything together. So that's the game development workflow in a nutshell. I hope it was helpful to see all those programs put together. And again, keep in mind, some of those programs you stay in in a day. Sometimes you spend in three days. Sometimes you only spend in five seconds because you're just trying to edit something and bring it back into your actual game and integrate it. Maybe you found a bug in the artwork or maybe you're trying to adjust the size of the sprite sheet. And that's fine. A lot of those iterations are kind of what you're supposed to do. Iterate. You're not supposed to create everything at once and it's perfect at the get-go. There's nothing wrong with editing, polishing, etc. And that's just you know how it works, how they work with the others. So I hope I illustrated that. I hope you could see how you can integrate some of those tools and some of the workflows I use, some of which I think are legit, some are kind of slow, but it is what it is. So I hope it was helpful. And again, if you got any questions, you can hit me up on the YouTube comments. You can contact me on Twitter. My name is Jester Excel. You can hit me up on email. It's jcwwebapsolution.com or jesterxcel.com. 
Google Plus, uh, you can hit me up there. We also have a really cool group for one game a month. The community setup there has over a thousand people now, and it's pretty pretty legit to see uh, a lot of people post their work. It's definitely uh, very motivational and helpful. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again.